Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's an honor to be with you all tonight. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, thank you so much for the invite, um, and thank you for allowing me to share tonight. Um, it's a blessing to be here with all of you tonight. And so, um, as he mentioned, my name is Joe, um, and uh, it's been that way since I was born. Um, so it's, uh, it's been a good name. Uh, Joseph, if you really want to know the real, you know, that's the nickname, but it's been that way since not Joe, Joel, not Joel, not Joey, it's been Joe. Okay, so <laughs> now you got it straight. So um, we're going to have a good time tonight. Anybody like to have fun in church? You like to have fun in church? I love Jesus. Jesus is great, and Jesus likes to have fun. So hopefully you like to have fun because heaven won't be fun if you're not if you don't like to have fun, you know? So, um, well, it will be fun regardless. <laughs> so we're, we're going to have a blast tonight. Um, but um, I just want to say again... Thank you for uh, allowing me to be here. I got a message that I'm going to share, but before I do, how many of you in the room, you're youth age? Raise your hand if you're youth age. Um, I was expecting everybody to raise your hand. How many of you are youth age? Raise that hand. There you go. There you go. We're, we're having fire night tonight, so we're going to have a blast. Um, I love youth, and, and I, you know what's hard when you, you start to get older? You still think of yourself as a younger person, right? So, like, you start looking, you start driving around, and you, you start, you're like, man, that person's really old. How old are you? And you'll walk up, and how old are you? And they're, like, two years younger than you and you're like oh whoa okay <laughs> yeah won't ask that question anymore you know but um but I, I just I love I love having fun and I love youth and uh just a, a little bit about me if you've never met me before I've been here before how many of you remember the, like maybe the last time I was here okay a few of you okay cool uh I'll give you the the load down I'm Cuban and Italian with a Polish last name there you go you do the math on that one. Uh, so uh, my grandfather was adopted. So it was pretty interesting how that all happened. And what's really cool is I'm related to a pirate. So, yeah, yeah. We're not quite sure if we're related to a pirate. I mean, we're, we're, we're close. Like, we're one, you know, but, but, you know, that's protected information. So we've tried to find out, and I can tell you the real story of all of it, but we think we are. Um, I love Chick-fil-A. Anybody love Chick-fil-A? Yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. One cool small fact. It doesn't really matter tonight, but hey, it, I'm going to tell you anyways. Uh, Chick-fil-A, if you didn't know this, you can like get the app and you can put down every single time you buy from Chick-fil-A and you get points. There you go. So we bought all the youth Chick-fil-A at conference and somehow I got 95,000 points at Chick-fil-A. So please pray for me because I've got... Plenty of food to eat over the next year. So, because we're going to do it again next year. Um, I, I'm all for the free food. There you go. Chick-fil-A. I, I used to like running. Now, I don't so much. Um, I, I try to run. Uh, I try to exercise when I can. I need to get better at that. Confession time. Here we go. So, um, uh, the other things that, uh, just quick uh, little information about me is I've been married uh, now since uh, 2007, so you do the math. I'm still trying to figure it out in my head right now. <laughs> uh, no, I think it's about 17 years, 18 years. There you go. Um, so we're celebrating this year. Uh, um, Natalie is incredible. She's, uh, she's so amazing, um, incredible preacher. She's actually working on her doctorate in ministry and concentration in preaching, preaching with the uh, the role of the Holy Spirit in preparation and preaching. So it's, uh, it's an incredible thing she's doing at Liberty University. So that's a really great uh, school as well. And um, we ha I have two dogs. I have a Chihuahua and I have a Lab. So I got a Chihuahua, little tiny guy, doesn't even weigh like eight pounds. And I got a Lab, which is like 85 pounds. All right. So they, uh, they love each other, um, so they're good. They're good for each other. So tonight I want to talk to you about being real. Dare to be real. Dare to be real. Dare to be real. What makes us real? And I'm going to concentrate tonight on our experiences in life and the, how those experiences challenge us to be real in our walk with God and in everything that we do. So I'm going to tell you a quick story. Um, so many years ago, um, we, uh, we decided we were going to start a young adult group in our church. So my wife and I served as youth pastors for about seven years. 
then we became evangelists, then we became missionaries, and Natalie's still a missionary, um, and, um, and then we've been taking over and being the youth directors here for the last four years, which has been an honor to do all of those things. But we, when we were youth pastors, um, we started a young adult group, and one of the things that the young adults wanted to do was to go out and have a retreat, right? Well, we had a small group, so it wasn't a lot of them. We had maybe 10 or 15 in our group. Um, and so uh, we, we kind of just asked them, what, it, what would you like to do? What is something you guys would want to do? And they're like, we want to go camping. And I was like, oh, man. I have to go back to Royal Ranger days, you know, like, you know, figure this out. How are we going to put up a tent, you know, the whole thing. So we, they, they, they thought it was going to be the greatest idea of all time for us to go camping. And so, you know, thankfully here in Florida, you can go to campgrounds and, you know, so it's not as much as just like going into the woods and just, you know, kind of finding a spot, you know. So we went to a campground and we're thinking to ourselves, this is going to be great. It was in a wooded area here in Florida. And, um, and so the park ranger, when we pull up to the park, you, you know, you pay to get in, you pay per car. And um, so you pull up to the thing and the guy goes, hey, we just want to warn you, there's been uh, bear activity. I'm like, bro, we live in Florida, y'all. Like, we don't have bear. No, he's like, no, seriously, I'm not joking. I, I thought he was kidding, right? So I'm making jokes. The, the young adults are in the car. I'm like, this, this guy's crazy. Uh, I've never seen a bear all of my life here in Florida. I've never seen a bear, like, just, just near me. You know what I mean? Like, I've seen them on, like, you know, social media and TV, like, on the news and stuff like that, but never near me, right? So, um, and at this point in time, I think it was maybe, like, 15 years ago. So, we just decide, hey, you know what? Let's go. Let's set up. Let's, let's just find a spot um, there at the campground, and, and we'll just set up our tents, and we'll have a great time. And um, so we're driving through, and they, you just pick the spot you want. Um, but I didn't realize the spot we picked was close to the dumpsters. So you kind of hear, you kind of see, you're thinking ahead here. Uh, so we're having a great time. We're, you know, they tell us, hey, be careful with your food, keep your food in the car, all these different things. And so we, like I said, I thought they were joking. And so we are having a great time. We start a fire. We do the whole thing, right? We're camping. Young adults are having a great time. It's about 12 o'clock. We decide, hey, we're going to go to bed. You know, put out the fire. We all get into our tents. And I'm telling you, it wasn't like 30 minutes later that all of a sudden we start hearing, Ooh. We start hearing noises. We start hearing scratching. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm in a tent, and Natalie didn't go camping this time, so, um, or any time. But uh, she, she um, <laughs> we're there, and um, we're there. And all of a sudden, the guy in the tent goes, Pastor Joe, Pastor Joe. Like, and I'm trying to figure out what he's saying because he's saying it so under his breath. At this point, he had been frozen solid, pretty much, couldn't move his arms, and he could barely move his mouth, and he's, Pastor Joe, Pastor Joe. He's freaking out. I'm like, what? He goes, do you hear that? I'm like, yes, yeah, shut up. I'm like, let the other people talk. I'm not going to die tonight. And the next thing we hear is this loud banging against the dumpster. Yes, there was a bear in our campground, in our campsite, and every single young adult is now, from what I hear, me and the other guy are still in our tent. Every other young adult is now in our van, <laughs> sleeping. And we're there, and there, we're the two talking back and forth, and I find this out. I find this out. Then the next thing, we, 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 all of this goes by, uh, bear left or whatever. I wake up in the morning early, and I look out, and there's one of the young adults sitting there, and the fire is on. I'm like, what in the world happened? I go, hey, man, you okay? He goes, yeah, I couldn't sleep. I was like, you couldn't sleep? He's like, yeah, I've been awake for like six hours. So apparently the bear left. He went out, started the fire, and stayed up all night by himself by the fire. So we all got to, you know, sleep at that point. I mean, we're all freaking out, but we got to sleep. Now, the one thing I learned in this experience is don't go, 
you know, camping. Yeah. So um, that was the big experience. <laughs> no. Um, that experience, I'll remember it for the rest of my life, right? Um, but it, it, was, it was kind of a crazy scenario. And um, I share that with you to kind of segue into our experiences with God, the things that we go through in our lives. You know, we can remember, remember them and they'll shape us. I'll tell you this, I'll never leave food out if I ever go camping again. Either that or I'm going to get a hotel and everybody else can go camping. But, um, but what we learned in this is that experiences don't shape who we become, rather how we perceive and internalize those experiences is what makes us real or fake. That's true. It's how we internalize those experiences that make us who we are, real or fake. You know, we go through things in life and we can look in and say, oh, okay, well, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run and I'm gonna go this direction or I'm gonna go the other direction because I don't wanna have that or I don't wanna go through that experience again. If you have your Bibles with me, I wanna share with you a very well-known experience in the Bible. It's in Exodus chapter three. You probably have heard this before. Um, Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Um, I, I, I want to challenge us tonight because when we think about a night uh, like tonight, coming together and talking, uh, you know, we call it a fire night, right? What is this night really about? You know, I, I don't know 100% the, the vision of a night like this, but here's what I do know is that it's a night where we can refocus come into the presence of God and saturate ourselves in his presence, right? We're all going through difficult things. We're all going through life situations. And the only thing that helps us continue in life and to pursue and to walk in a, in a life with joy, passion, and, and everything that we need is those experiences that we have with God, those moments with God. And so tonight, if anything, when you walk out of here, I hope you get everything that you need from the presence of God. Because I can, I can preach anything and everything I want to preach, but the presence of God is really what transforms us. Amen. Right? So Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, a priest in Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Oreb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame, of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. I want to explain something to you real quick about the job of a shepherd, right? The job of a shepherd was a very lonely position. A shepherd would go out into the fields and usually they were by themselves and they spent most of their time with sheep, or tending the flock, or whatever animal they're, they're watching, right? And that's pretty much it. Um, it, was, it was the very wealthy people would actually hire shepherds to tend to their flocks. So it was not necessarily a job that a, you know, a person who was very well off would do. They, they would usually hire people to come in and do this. There were not many people who aspired to be shepherds. It's not something that was like, hey, new, I'm going to be a shepherd for the rest of my life. Like people weren't growing up and begging for the position. So if you could imagine with me, Moses, who was in, you know, he, he grew up in Egypt he grew up in Pharaoh's house, had access to everything, all the money, everything he could even imagine. 
this person would probably not be the most likely person to be a shepherd, right? But as we all know, the story of Moses, obviously he fled Egypt and, you know, we see this scenario. 40 years later, we see this scenario. Um, so if you could kind of put yourself in this story and think of him, you know, like obviously he probably, you know, probably saw his life going a different direction when he was younger. But now he's living this life as a fugitive and probably hiding, right? Right? not really looking for anything else. If I was Moses, I would feel so insignificant, you know, in this moment of your life, right? So we think he was somewhere close to 40 years old when he left, and then he spent 40 years, uh, you know, away. So he's probably close to 80 years old at this point. And he's tending to the flock, and all of a sudden sees this burning bush, right? And there's probably been... 50, 100 messages you've heard about this. But this one experience that Moses has, it, what's so significant in this scripture that I see is that there's twice in this passage, just these four verses, there's twice where the, the scripture says he turned and looked. Well, actually, it's three times. It says, so he looked I will now turn aside and see, in scripture verse three, it says, I will now turn aside and see. And then in verse four, it says, he turned aside to look. So three times it's talking about him turning and looking towards this burning bush, right? Why do I see that as significant? It's because when God is trying to get our attention, how many times are we turning to look at God? You know, our experience with God, like God is here. God is here tonight. I was standing there. I was worshiping. And man, the worship was so incredible tonight. God was moving in the worship. I could feel the presence of God. God is here in this room right now. Amen. And so many times as Christians, the world gets, we get so, like you get so cluttered in our minds, in our hearts. Things are just, we get so busy with life, right? As teenagers, we get so busy. Oh man, I got homework tonight. I got this. I got to do this. I'm on this team. <coughs> I'm on this or whatever. And all of a sudden what happens is our minds and our hearts, we get cluttered, right? We get cluttered and we forget, we forget to look at Jesus. We forget to look at all the things that he has for us. And tonight, the experience that I'm just asking for us to have, if we can be honest with ourselves, is, you know, just like Moses, are we hiding issues in our lives? Are we turning to God and saying, God, I want you to transform and, and change the inside of me? See, that's kind of the first thing I want to share with you in our experiences, right? Right? When we go through things in life, right? So I went, I went, uh, I went uh, camping, and uh, you know I would have never had that that experience if I if I had not taken a step towards it, right? Driving those students there, setting up the tent, being there, turning turning myself to that area, and going and ex having that full experience in our lives. When we turn and we look towards those things that God is calling us to, that's when those experiences begin. See, the Bible tells us that Moses' father and mother were both Levites. And they were set apart, that, that the Levites were set apart to be the priests of Israel. Right? I, I don't know if you know this or not. Um, some people in this room may know biblical history and regular history. But today, if you were to go to Israel... Israel is actually, if you look at the tribes, tribes of Israel, the people who actually run the city of Jerusalem, the people who actually run the city of Jerusalem right now, today, are descendants of the tribe of the Levites and the tribe of Benjamin. They came together to rule Jerusalem. And so uh, I want to tell you this because uh, the tr tribe of Judah, the Levites, and, and the Benjamin, they run. And when you look at Israel, Israeli people today, 
most Israeli people today are descendants of those tribes, right? And Moses was a descendant of the Levites. So why am I sharing this with you? Because I, I kind of prefaced it. For 40 years, Moses ran away from Egypt. Moses ran away from Egypt and he's in hiding. And all of a sudden, there's this burning bush that's happening and he turns aside and looks. And the Bible tells us he turns aside and looks. Now, there is destiny in the middle of this bush. I mean, it's burning, but it's not being consumed. The Bible tells us it's burning and it's not being consumed. Why did I say there was destiny? Is because God's presence was there, right? And God's presence was there to meet with Moses. And what was the purpose of this? I mean, if you continue to read on, God is telling Moses, hey, I want you to go back to Egypt and I want you to save the children of Israel. This is that moment. He's telling Moses, hey, listen. It's been 40 years and your destiny is not gone. I think a lot of times in life, we have experiences in life and they pull us away. And sometimes we feel like maybe we, we missed something. We missed a mark. We missed God's calling on our life. We missed this. We missed that. And I don't know where you're at. Some of you in this room, maybe you feel like you've ran the race and you've done an incredible job and God has been using you in great and mighty ways. But there are times where we look back, even I look back at times in my life where I'm like, man, I missed the mark in this. I missed the mark in that. But here's what I want you to understand. When we look at this passage of scripture, we can see in Moses' life, God still had destiny on his life. God knew there was going to be a scenario and he was going to run. God knew all this stuff, but God, obviously, in a moment where Moses could have just kind of walked past this, he could have walked past this bush, he could have just completely forgot, he said, well, that's kind of weird, and just walked away. I mean, he could have lived in his discouragement. He could have lived in that hiding moment. But he decided in that second to turn and look, and then we see something very incredible that takes place. God calls him back to his destiny. God calls him back to something so incredible. We see in these verses a strong emphasis on Moses turning and looking. And um, I want to tell you a dream that I had several years ago. Um, I was, I was like, like I said, it was so many years, I'm probably 25 years old. There was a scenario in my life that was going on that was very difficult for me. Um, so my mom had gotten cancer and she was diagnosed to, you know, it was not a good situation. She ended up passing away. Um, but in that scenario, um, I was... I, I was trying and I was praying and I was asking God, God, speak to me, speak to me something about like what I can do. I was a leader in the church. I was a youth pastor. I was trying to preach. I was trying to lead our youth ministry. And, um, and so one night I go to sleep and I have this dream. And um, uh, God, you know, called me a long time ago to, to ministry and, and to evangelism and to reaching teenagers. And so I was having this dream and I was preparing for a service. While I was in the dream, I was preparing to go into the church, and, and there were people in the church, and they were, and they were like, you know, doing normal church pre-service stuff, right? Talking with each other, greeting each other. They were finding their ways to the seats, and all of a sudden, I in my dream, I I realized that the church was on fire, and I was. I was caught off guard, but then in the dream, I start running around the church screaming, the church is on fire, get out, get out of the church. And it got to the point where I start running to the pews and I come into the pews and I go to the people and I start screaming, the church is on fire, get out, get out. And People were not moving. People were not reacting. So I, in my dream, I go running out the back of the doors of the church. I see the firemen outside the church. And I say to the firemen, firemen, 
There's people in the building. They need to get out. The church is on fire. And the fireman looks at me. I don't know why I had this dream, but the fireman looks at me and says, it's too late. It's too late. We cannot go in. We cannot save those people. The fires consume too much of the building. We cannot go in and save those people. And so as I was like, I woke up in the middle of the night as I was seeing this dream. And I was so, I was so concerned because maybe, it's, maybe it was just me, but I was so concerned because as Christians, sometimes we think we're doing the right things. We think sometimes we're, we're attending church, we're sitting in the pews, we're showing up, and we're doing the responsibility that we're supposed to do as Christians. But then we're not fulfilling, like we're not having that true relationship with God. We're allowing things to keep us from, hi we're hiding from the things that God's calling on our life is. We're hiding. There's so many times in our lives that we have things that we're holding on to and that we, you know, there's these hidden things that we're holding on to that's keeping us from pursuing that relationship with Christ, that tightness with God. You know, and, and when I was kind of preparing this message about talking about Moses and thinking about this burden bush, burning bush moment, I was thinking about how Moses... He kind of thought he was doing what was right by hiding away from his destiny. And I, I started thinking about that dream that I had about us in the church. And, you know, sometimes God wants us to go and do the things that are dangerous to reach the world. God, sometimes God wants us to go out and be bold. Be, be the people who are willing to take the steps forward to do the things that no one else is willing to do, like coming to church on Wednesday night. Man, congratulations, that's amazing. I mean, I don't know how many people come on a Wednesday night anymore. But the truth is, is that God's calling us to go out and be bold examples for him. You know, every single Sunday, every single time we walk through these doors, we need to have an encounter with God's presence because we need to take the presence of God outside of the church. Amen. We don't need it just to stay here. Right. Like, we're not successful where we're going if the presence of God just stays in this building. Right. It has to live inside of us. It has to dwell inside of us so we can take it out of this room yes. and we can reach the people around us. See, after this dream, I felt like God was telling me that people are turning their eyes away from him. And at times, we don't even realize it. You know, our intimacy with God is dying. Our, our integrity is failing as a society. The purity is being compromised. We're seeing this all over the place. Young people... I want to challenge you because every single day we are being challenged to stand for God or to kind of fly with culture, right? Culture is becoming that thing where, you know, this is what everybody does. And the truth is, is that's fine. That's fine that everybody else does it. But my question is, does God want you to do it? It's not about what the world does. It's about what God is calling us to be, and that is to be sold out examples for him. Yeah. You know, I, I, I was talking, uh, we were talking uh, at the restaurant before we got here, and uh, I know we've kind of mentioned college football a little bit tonight and rivalries and different things of that nature. Um, there's three things I love in this world. That's Jesus, my wife, and UCF football, okay? <laughs> there you go. So we might get USC's coach, so... I don't know, but we'll see. But um, here's the deal. You know, when we think about our lives and the things we're passionate about, I would pass up all of the passion for those things if I could see people come to know Jesus. Like if, I, if somebody told me, hey, you could go and preach the gospel and see one person get saved or you could go to a football game, I would choose every single day to get the opportunity to share the love of Jesus with somebody. Amen. Right. 
And I think in our society, we've, we've forgotten really what it means to turn and look at what God's doing. You know, we, we've allowed the attention of the world to take away from us. Even in services, we'll come and the presence of God is here and, and our minds are so consumed that a lot of times we forget how great God is. Like, man, for real, people, I don't know about you, but I've been in moments where I've had like $3 in the bank account and I've sat at the presence of God and worshiped God and I felt like I was sitting in the kingdom of heaven and I still walked out and couldn't eat, you know? But at the end of the day, I got the presence of God. I got so filled with the love of Jesus that, man, I felt, I felt like the, I could conquer the world. You know, there were moments where I can remember sitting here and writing in a journal and in the presence of God and saying, God, I want to change the world. God, I want to lead teenagers. God, I want to I want to see lives transformed. And gosh, just a few years ago, we did the math. We looked at it and there was like 10,000 teenagers that got saved in, in the time that we've been doing ministry. And I'm like, God, thank you. Like dreams that, that we've written down in the, alt, in, in the altar, in the presence of God. I got to take that over any dollar amount ever in my life. Praise God. The destiny that God has on your life is to change the world. Right. Yes. You know, and the destiny was on Moses. And he came to a realization in that moment. He looked at that. And, and I want to ask you very simply, when was the last time you had an encounter with Jesus? When did you have, when was the last time you took a moment where you said, hey, you know what? The world is falling apart around me, but I need a moment with Jesus to just sit there and to refocus and to be challenged and to, you know, there's so much going on. I don't even know what people are going through in this place, but there's so much going on. But I will tell you this, your, the moments with Jesus do so much more for you than anything else that you can imagine. The second thing I wanted to share tonight uh, about this is that there was an adjustment that was made in Moses' life. Right? So he's standing there, fire's burning. Moses is there, you can read the scriptures. Moses is there. He's seeing the fire of God. He's, he's talking to the bush. God's calling him to go back to Egypt. And what's kind of crazy is in, in verse 13 of that, that scenario, in verse 13, Moses looks at it. So it's, oh, well, actually, Exodus 4, 13. So, um, so just one chapter over, Exodus 4, 13. Moses looks at Jesus and says these words. Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. I want to challenge you in this thought process tonight. You know, he was scared. He was scared. He didn't know what he was going to go, go into. He was, he had been in hiding like we had talked about. And um, one of the things that he had to, to accomplish in that moment is he had to trust that God's adjustments for his life were going to lead him in the right direction. And I told you that tonight I wanted to dare you to be real and that our experiences cause us to have moments where it defines who we are, whether we're going to be real or whether we're going to be fake. And um, God shows us through our intimacy with him, how we can walk in freedom and victory. And in Moses' life, he was at a very down, I believe he was in a very down place. You know, I, I shared with you why the, the role of the, the shepherd, because I wanted you to understand 
he kind of saw himself. I, I really believe he kind of saw himself that he lost all value. He lost he lost his destiny. He lost all value in his life. He lost everything that he thought was valuable to him. You know, he, he would, he, he, I believe he truly thought he was going to save his nation when he was in the palace. And, and part of the reason why I believe that is because obviously he went out to stop. He went out and killed the Egyptian soldier, right? He was, he was trying. I feel like he thought this is my purpose. I'm, I'm going to help them. And, and he didn't completely know exactly which way to go. I mean, he, he was trying. He was trying to do the right things. And then he fled. And I feel like in that moment, when he was standing there in the bush and God was calling it, he, I, I feel like he so badly felt that he missed God. I feel like he so badly felt like he missed God. God's call and God's destiny for his life, they literally was telling God, send someone else. Sure. I, it's not me. It's not. Like he so badly disbelieved in himself that he was telling God, you know what? Somebody else needs it. And what's so incredible is when we hear the rest of the story, God tells him, no, I'm with you. What do, what do, they, what do I tell people? What do I do? Moses says, says to God, what do I tell people? Tell them I am sent you. Yeah. Right. Like he's, God has to encourage Moses. God has to challenge Moses. Listen, I'm with you. And, and, and what, I love to say this because I've heard this said before and I felt like this was kind of a, a, a statement of my life was that, um, you know, when we think our, what we're faced with and the things we encounter and the places we go and, and the, the things we see in our life are too big for us or they're too grand for us or maybe we're too old or maybe we're too young or maybe we can't accomplish what God is telling us to do. Here's what I want to tell you. I heard this statement about, I mean, I don't even know how many years ago, but I heard this statement and I've been thinking about it every single day when I walk out the front door that me and God is enough. And honestly, I can take me out of the picture and God is enough, right? Like, so if it's you and God, you can change the world. If it's you and God, you can see people's lives transformed. You can share your go the gospel at, in your public school. You can share the gospel there in the hallways. You can, you can love on people and they can experience something great from the Heavenly Father that we serve. Good. Yeah. Good. And today, I want to tell you this is that there's an adjustment that was made in Moses' mind. We see it because he walked away from that encounter. And, and we, don't even really, we don't even really know what happened there. Like, it's not like he went back to, you know, obviously he went back and talked with his wife and his father-in-law and all these other people and said, hey, I'm out of here. I got to go to Egypt, you know, and made the two-week journey all the way over to Egypt and, you know, and did some incredible things. Like, we read in Scripture I mean, God was with him everywhere. And the children of Egypt come out of bondage and slavery. Yep. God used him. You know, I share all this to say it was that one encounter that took somebody that had really given up on life. That one encounter, he turned and said, man, there's something I need to focus. There was an adjustment that was made in his heart. And that fear, that discouragement started to fade in his life. And he, he started to walk and live out that destiny. You know, I share this message because I truly believe that if we never take risk we restrain our ability to run in full confidence of our destiny. That's good. If we never take risk, let's put it this way. Sometimes we come to the altars and we ask for forgiveness, but then when we get up and we walk out those doors, we don't change because we're afraid of what changing really would accomplish. We have to allow God to change us 
And we got to hold on for the bumpy ride because the bumpy ride is actually going to be so much fun. How many of you have ever been on a roller coaster? I mean, I love going on roller I can't do it so often anymore, but I still love it, you know? We're putting in a zip line at the youth camp. It's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to do it as many times as I can until I can't do it. But, you know, the truth is, is running in your destiny, God knows us better than we do. Right? I, if I had it my way, I think I've said this before, but I, if I had it my way, I probably would have been in the, in the FBI. Like, straight up. Like, I was going to go to accounting school. I was going to be... I was going to... And I, the reason is because I really liked wearing suits. I thought that was really fun. And I liked guns. So I wanted to, like, wear guns. And I, I didn't really understand the whole, like, you have to protect people thing, you know, bulletproof. I didn't really. But I probably would have gone into the FBI. Because that, to me, just sounded like fun, you know. Like, I was like, this is going to be great. And, but God knows me better than I know me. And so, like, many years ago, God diverted my passions for that and move me into ministry to reach and share the love of Jesus with people. And the reason I say that to you is because, you know, I've spent the last almost 20 years of my life preaching the gospel. And every single day I look back and I don't regret one moment of it. Because as I'm chasing after God's destiny for my life, the joy and the passion of my life has always been there. You may not have the largest bank account. You may not have the, the nicest ride out there. Like You may not have all the, the glamours of everything, but what you have is God's complete stamp of approval on your life. That, you know, when you come before God and you're going through difficult moments and family members are hurting or, or you're going through difficulty and you've got people far from God and, and you start praying and pressing in and asking God to move in your situation, guess what happens? There's a peace that comes over you. And when you stand before heaven, you start to realize, God, man, I have, I have chased after you. I have given you all that I can. And the truth is, God gives you those right words to share with people. God gives you those right things to say. And, to, and he gives you encounters and moments. He gives you divine destiny with these people in your lives and, and these people in your, in your community so that you can be an example and a different, you can see God make a difference in their lives. Right. Tonight, all of this kind of boils down to just a couple things for us. The Bible is clear. It shares with us that, you know, the renewing of our mind, right? That the word of God renews our mind and renews our heart. My question today is when we think about being real, when was the last time we had true encounters with God? We come to church, we spend time in worship, we leave. But when was the last time we spent time in the Word and read our Bibles? When was the last time we worshiped at homes, put on worship CDs and, and prayed in the morning, prayed for those people in our lives, those people in, in, in our community, those people that we have life with, you know, we walk into work every single day and you've got that person at work that just sets you off right, right away. You know, you're like, you're like, hey, how you doing? You have a good day. Life sucks. You know, and it's like, wow, great, awesome. I'll see you later. You know, like, we, we encounter moments every single day where we can be a light. We can be who God wants us to be. Some of us in this room, you know, we're, we're living and we're going through life and we're doing, you know, the mundane. But God's called us for more. And we're being held back. We're holding ourselves back. Well, my destiny's over. That moment in my life is over. But my question is, God done with you? Because I don't think he is. All across this room... I want to challenge you. When was the last time you read, spent time in the word of God? When was the last time you were reading and praying? Young people, when was the last time you opened that phone and that Bible app, you know? We got it. 
Let's, let's do something in our walk with God. Like if we want to be bold for Jesus, if we want the passion and the power of God to run through us, what does it take? It has, it, it has to infiltrate our hearts. It has to infiltrate our minds. When I was about eight, 16 years old, I remember being a young person in our church and we used to have Sunday night services. I don't know if you guys do Sunday night services anymore. We used to do Sunday night services and missionaries would come every Sunday night. We'd have a missionary and they'd come up there and they'd share what they're doing. And I remember very distinctly there was this missionary from Siberia. And the only reason I know that is because there was a video that went, Siberia! And it was like crazy. <laughs> and I just remember that. Siberia! You remember that for the rest of your life now. It was just great. You remember the video? Yeah, see, he remembers the video. <laughs> Siberia! It was like it just started. And, um, but we'd have missionaries every single Sunday night. And um, those missionaries would get up there and they'd start sharing about reaching lost people. They'd share about being bold for Jesus, going into other countries where people have never heard the gospel. They'd share these stories They'd share these experiences they were having. And I would sit there and I'd say, God, man, I'm going through a hard time in life, you know? Well, well, what's so hard about life? You got a good dad. You got a good mom. You go into a Christian school. You got a car when you were 15 years old. You got, what's so hard about life? Life, life, that's what's so hard about life. Life is hard. What was so hard about life was I wasn't living right for Jesus. I was struggling, you know. You get made fun of at school for being not this person or that person. I went, I struggled. And I'd go every single Sunday night, I'd, I'd see the missionary up there and I'd see them taking bold risks for God. And every Sunday night I'd come to the altar and I'd kneel down on my knees and I'd say, God, use me one day, just use me, use me, use me. I didn't know what I was praying for. And for some reason, the worship pastor at my church, every Sunday night would come down and start praying for me and start laying his hands on me and praying for me. God, use him. God, use him. Make him, make him bold for you. Make him bold for you. For, for like two years, every Sunday night, I'd come and I'd come to the altar and just pray, God, use me. God, use me. God, use me. It was those experiences that gave me boldness to walk away from what I thought I wanted so that I could fulfill destiny in my life. It was not, it wasn't like I just walked out and said, God, I'm gonna do this one day and just walk out and did it without his internal blessings and presence and power in my life. There was a boldness, I can tell you right now, I would never have been standing in front of a group of people preaching if I was 16 years old. I was so nervous, I was so scared, I was so afraid to be bold for Jesus. And my challenge for you today is very simple. Will you let the moments in God's presence, will you let the encounters in God's presence define your destiny? Will you be real in what God has for you? Will you allow those moments in God's presence to pull the greatness out of you? See, all across this room tonight, I want to challenge you to be bold. I want to challenge you because I feel like there's times where we look at who we are. And we come, come to a place where we say, man, I know there's more. I know, I know God has more for me. But we choose other things. Busyness of life, right? Like we're getting ready to go into the hot, like to Christmas season. There's lots of Christmas parties. There's lot, lots of things going on, right? You got Christmas parties at your school. You got you, pageants. You've got everything, everything you can imagine right now. The busyness of life. And, and the hardest part is that it's not just in this time frame that it's like that. 
Sometimes we allow these things. We allow just stuff to get in the way. Wake up in the morning, oh, I gotta get, I gotta get over here, I gotta get over there. And we forget to spend time in the presence of God. Like destiny, destiny is not something that just pops up in our life. It's something we pursue. It like literally Moses is running for 40 years. The fire is burning. He comes over, he finally turns, he looks at it. God speaks to him. I, I wonder how many years he missed God's speaking to his life. I wonder how many, I mean, this is divine. I, I mean, I'm not speaking, I'm not trying to change what the scripture is saying, but I wonder how many times Moses turned away from God's call on his life before he finally looked at it and said, God, okay. I give up. You know, it takes more effort to run away from your destiny than it does to run towards your destiny. It takes more effort to walk away from what God is calling you to do than it does to walk towards it. Some of us in this room, we've got people in our neighborhood, we've got people in our family, and we have been avoiding them like the plague. We've been, oh, I'm not talking to them. I'm not, no, I can't, I can't. I can't. We run away from what we know God has called us to do. And it takes more effort to do that. A question. It's just very simple. Will you turn and look and will you let God adjust what needs to be adjusted so that you can change the world? We all know, we all know what happened. I think the number, like, people make guesses, but I think the number is somewhere close to 3 million people were saved out of Egypt, came into the promised land, right? <laughs> There's another message that I preach, and I'm not going to preach that now, but um, there's another message that I preach about how Joshua went into the presence with Moses. Like everything Moses did, Joshua would go in, go into the presence. He'd spend time with God. You know, the story of Joshua would have never happened had it not been one encounter at the fire for Moses. I'm sure maybe God would have used somebody else, but God wanted to use Moses. And the truth is, God wants to use you. God wants to challenge us. And it all happens in his presence. And so tonight, I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes all across this room. This wasn't necessarily a message about sin, but there are people in this room that you've been running from Jesus. You've got sin in your life. You've got lust. You've got anger. You've got, you've got pride. You've got sexual sin. You've got unforgiveness. And the truth is, is that you can't really chase after your destiny if you're living in sin. So whether you're a young person or you're, you're older, in this room, maybe tonight, you say, you know what? Part of the reason why I've been hiding from God's destiny on my life is because I'm living in sin. And if that's you tonight and you want to get right with Jesus, I want you to slip your hand up wherever you're at. You got sin in your life. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? You got sin in your life tonight. And you say, you know what? I, I want to get right with God tonight. Is there anyone else? I see the hand. You can put it down. There's a few others I see, but you can put it down. Anyone else? That's right. I've been chasing the wrong things. I've been running after the wrong things. You know, I've been living a life. I've been hiding things from my family. I've been hiding things from whatever it is. If that's you, slip your hand up. Thank you. You can see. We're going to pray a prayer together, and I'm going to ask every person to repeat this after me. It's just a simple prayer of forgiveness. Asking Christ to come and be the Lord of your life. 
I want every person to pray this because I don't want to, you know, embarrass anybody or I don't want anybody to feel singled out. But if you raise your hand tonight, here's what I'm going to ask. I want to ask you, whether it's your youth pastor or pastor, I want you tonight to just come to them after the service is over and say, you know what, I really, I prayed that prayer tonight. I really meant it. And I really want to get, I want to get solid in my walk with God. But if that's you tonight, every single person in this room, we're going to pray this prayer. I want you to repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I've been living in sin. And I choose today to live for you, to make you the Lord and Savior. I want to live right. I want to live sold out for you. Passionate. Without sin. I want to walk in complete abandonment with you, Jesus. Amen. Here's what I'm going to ask tonight. Pastor Meredith is up there and She's, she's going to start singing and she's going to start worshiping. I don't know if the worship team's going to come with her. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do tonight. I want you to take a moment and turn to God. Say, God, adjust the things you need to adjust in my life. I want to go after you. I want to be on fire for you. I want to be passionate for you. I want the destiny on my life. To, I want to fulfill that destiny on my life. I want to be like Moses. I want to allow the adjustments to take place. And I want to run. I want to go where you lead me. I want to do the things you've called me to. So as she begins to sing, if you want to come forward and worship, if you want to come to the altars, if you want to press in right where you're at, you can do that. But tonight we're going to just take a moment and just say, Jesus... Change me. Jesus, set me on fire. I want to be real. I want to be real. I don't want to hide. I want to be who you've called me to be. I want the experience and the presence of God to transform me and change me.